Sorry guys, uh, we have a slightly different setup here. Normal, normal, normal. Uh, let me mute this. Um, Matthias, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I don't think I have a way to share my screen here in this app right now. Um, I think I can share my screen when we're ready to do that. So we're gonna, we need a minute or two more to get Emmett set up and then we'll get ready to start, okay? Yeah, no worries. Also, this is a little weird. Because we're getting a little mm -hmm. feedback, I have to um, mute your audio when I'm talking. So just mm -hmm. be aware that there might be a delay there. Okay, no worries.
Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there's going to be a C sharp scripting class for Grasshopper for those of you who use Grasshopper but maybe want to go a little bit further than the built-in nodes that you're already given. So that's going to be in. There's going to be one in June and then another one in September, given by uh, along in. Okay, um, and then in terms of our future presentations, we're going to next month. We're going to have a presentation by Cesar, who's going to give kind of a summary of the projects that were at the uh, Seattle and the San Francisco AEC hackathons. Um, in June, we're looking at inviting Alessandro Bagini, who is going to who is a structural engineer at SOM, to talk about some of the things that he's been working on there. Um, and then in August, we've also scheduled uh, a partnership with Autodesk to talk about the Unity anniversary party. Okay. Um, and lastly, we want to thank our, our sponsors, the SFAIA, who, who gave us the space so that we could be here, and also Desalt Systems, who's providing the food, the food, which should be up here shortly. Okay. Um, so our first speaker, uh, Mateus, he's a research, research assistant at VTU, where he's involved in AI, AI research. Previously, he worked at CITA in Copenhagen on projects like uh, machine learning, architectural geometry, and generative algorithms. Um, he's also authored many um, many plugins for Grasshopper, and he currently runs Object, which is a company that um, does computational design consultancy. So let's welcome him, and I'm going to switch this off. Uh, so go ahead, Matthias. Oh, OK. Uh... Where uh, I'm kind of confused a bit, I'm sorry. Uh, can I use my presentation here or? Oh, okay. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Now is that is that fine? Can I just ask you? Can you see my screen right now? Just to double check, and am I clear? Yeah, we're good. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So my name is Mateusz Zwierzycki, and I run Object Consultancy. Uh, well, uh, I have I think like half an hour <laughs> to go through this presentation. There is quite a lot to cover. So pardon me for a rush. Uh, firstly, I wanted to introduce you to, to like just briefly to object of my, my, my history, my personal uh, developer's history. So you might be familiar with some tools which I made for Grasshopper. Uh, one of them is Anemone here, uh, which enables looping in Grasshopper. So it's no longer directed basically graphs. It's, it's more like directed graphs. <laughs> Uh, which kind of broke Grasshopper, <laughs> uh, if you are being orthodox. Um, I another uh, plugin or code which I developed for Grasshopper was the Polymesh and Starlink libraries, which are, I think they are at least partially open source for uh, complex mesh operations and so on. Uh, if from 2015 and to till 2017, I worked at CETA. So that's uh, part of the Royal Academy of Arts in Denmark. And see that's a part of the architectural school there. And the, the first project which I worked on was actually Dora Art. So this is the project <clears throat> which was composed of, the, of, of those seven institutions here. And one of the institutions was CETA, which I was employed there. And this software was used to uh, well, introduce the point clouds to uh, the designers uh, through a, like a really friendly user interface in Grasshopper. And well, there 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 have been some more projects which I was working on. Uh, yeah, one of them was, uh, for instance, the bridge to the bridge to far project, which I will I will actually refer to in a couple of other slides later on. 
So as, as a freelancer, I had the pleasure to work with Agenta uh, Process Design, it's a company which might you might be familiar, uh, maybe from, I don't know, Arc Daily or the Zine, they published this uh, Nava project, uh, which I had the pleasure to uh, work on partially as a, as a parametric design developer. So those are the results of the, the parametric modeling here. And you can see they went through quite a few design options before they chose the right one. And I also had the pleasure to work with yours, Larman Lab, on a couple of projects. So you might be familiar with those as well. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of high quality meshing here. And the most recent of my endeavors into developing software for designers and architects as well is the owl so um, owl is a, is a small framework uh, to make ai and machine learning accessible to designers and this presentation is mostly based on my experiences with owl but also it's based on my research which i which i kind of did do at the uh, in campus so <clears throat> after this small introduction to object, I, I wanted to talk about AI in design and what I'm currently doing, what I'm currently questioning <laughs> with my research. So before we go any further, uh, I wanted to make clear that what machine learning is, where it lies in the context of artificial intelligence and where it, where it lies in the context of computer science. In the machine learning, we also have different branches. The main branches are supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning. And well, in this presentation, we won't really have enough time to go through all of those points. But uh, yeah, this takes a while to describe all of those different ways of, of using machine learning, uh, different different ways of doing machine learning. But I'll try to try to um, well describe them as necessary on the on the on the way. So recently, I, I stumbled upon this paper, which is from the International uh, Journal of Computer, uh, yeah, of Computer AI. So that's the that's the that's the journal, and uh, well, there was a I found this paper by John Gura, and the fun part is that it's from 1991, and it's a ten problems for AI in design. I can tell you right away that half of them is not even not even scraped by any research so far. And I just found it really interesting that there are so many problems that even 30 years later, almost 30 years later, we are still not, 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 not even close to actually solving them. Or not even close to actually figuring out what are, what are the precise questions leading to solving those problems. So uh, yeah, I just want to go each one to, to each one of them and, and talk a bit about each one of them and and basically answer find an answer to each one of those problems uh, using the current tools basically. So the first problem is the representation in design and this is what do like what part of the reality do we actually have to provide for AI to be able to to use the AI effectively in the real world. And uh, yeah, we can we can think about the point cloud, for instance. And this is where you know the car currently, if you have any kind of of, an, of a real building, and you don't have a three D model, you can actually enter and make a three D scan. But to get any kind of knowledge out of that three D scan, you need some kind of tools. And also, the question here in the problem number one lies in: Is the three D scan actually the only data, or actually, is it capturing all of the data about the building? So, this is this is the first problem. The second problem is once you have this knowledge, once you captured some part of the reality, or maybe you predicted some kind of uh, you know construction site reality, is how to how to encode this knowledge and how to start to use this knowledge. So this is this is where we deal with the second problem, which is design semantics, semantics, which is coding and decoding. And it's worth saying that since the 90s, early 90s, uh, well, we saw a, a huge uh, propagation of parametric modeling in design. 
and also BIM modeling design. So I believe that, at least partially, we touched the problem of design semantics that is quite well explored today. So uh, this, this leads to, to other problems, of course, with parametric models, we have a comb combinatorial explosion. With BIM, on the other hand, well, we, we don't really have, mm, let's say, flexible ways of getting the data in and out. It's always some kind of a pain, especially if you have multiple tools working on a single model. And yeah, but this is this is what we do with parametric models. We basically describe the parameters, we describe the geometry, we can change the geometry, so we that way we encode the geometry. And well, that leads to the third problem. So once we have the models, once we have the data encoded. How do we manipulate the knowledge? Right. So that's inference and design, that's the first problem. And this is an example of Hanoi Tower, which I use every time I describe this problem. It's basically, uh, the problem which I want to talk about is basically how do we get from this stage to this stage, right? So this is how do we infer the, how do we deduct the, the rules which, which, which Hanoi Tower has only from this image. How would you define those rules based on the first four images and maybe on the last image? You as you know, probably most of human beings would be able to say that, well, the, the rules are that you can only put a smaller uh, disk on a larger disk and only you can put one at a time. And then, you know, the end position of, the, of each of the disks is here. The start position is here, you know, get from here to here. The problem with AI and the problem with machine learning, I mean, let's talk about AI more briefly. The problem with AI is that even if you have the model, and if you have the data, and if you have the knowledge, you still don't have the way to detect anything about it. Right? So in this case, we can talk about the, <clears throat> the post, uh, post, stamping, uh, uh, post stamp collector problem as well, which is uh, something quite well known in AI, in the field of AI. And here I would say it's, if you don't give any rules to AI, it can simply, you know, cut the pegs off and basically move the entire bit once at a time. Right? So instead of following the rules, which we kind of infer from the images, it can invent its own rules and just follow those rules to get the easiest solution. And this is a great problem in design. And uh, yeah, and I don't think that there is uh, any good answer for that yet. Uh, yeah, so, so problem number four is combinatorial explosion design, and this is directly linked to, let's say, the, 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 the sprawl of, of parametric modeling, modeling currently. So as soon as, so I'm, I'm just gonna quote the paper, as soon as a system deals with what could be, then it could go on indefinitely. So it means once the system learns how to do stuff, it just does, does a lot of, this stuff, and then we have a problem, right? So one of the papers, and I think that this problem number four, the combinatorial explosion design is quite well uh, resolved in the current stage of, of design and architecture. It's something which was uh, explored by, for instance, David Stasik here and uh, Matt Ramsgar Thompson from CETA. In their paper, Learning to be Evolved, they used KMIS clustering to define uh, different families uh, you know, the different families emerging from a single parametric model. That way, and uh, that we are able, able to create this catalog of all the, all the possible parametric models or all the possible forms emerging from the parametric model. Uh, but there is more. So uh, John Harding, on the other hand, uses self-organizing maps to create a subset of a high, hyper-dimensional space solution space of a parametric model, in this case is a four-dimensional ellipse. Uh, the four dimensions are the major minor axis, the grayscale and the rotation. And he uses self-organizing maps to create this interpolation, which in fact is a, is a subset of the hyper-dimensional solution space. So this is like a, a magic selection tool, right? Uh, to, to describe it in a, you know, layman's terms. Uh, and I also been experimenting with autoencoders, and this is a, a result of a workshop which I held in Dubai, 
this uh, one one group came up with this parametric model of a bench, and we used a different way of, of creating those hyperdimensional maps. Uh, we use autoencoders instead of self-organizing maps. So this is this common neural explosion. And of course, we have optimization. So optimization is basically looking for the the best solution in the in the solution space. So rather than selecting a part of the solution space, we are looking for a single point which deals with the with the task the best. So in the bridge to far in the bridge to far project, we we had a fully parametric model of the bridge, which was actually analyzed under different with different evaluation tools and. Uh, we came up with some kind of a fitness score and we tried to optimize this bridge for a couple of different metrics. So this is this is basically the answer to the question how to find the, the one the best solution right rather than uh, you know, be lost in the in the in the in the vastness of the parametric space. And uh, yeah here we have another example where we actually know that uh, <clears throat> The guys who did the facade were actually using chemist clustering to optimize the facade. Optimizing the facade was basically done by redu reducing the, um, the variation of the panels. So in the beginning, there were like 20,000 different panels, different hexagonal panels. But by introducing a gap between the panels, they were able to reduce the, the, types, the number of types of the panels, the families, to something around 100 different families. And I think I have a link to the issue, uh, link uh, to an issue publication which actually describes this process. And if not, just I can just link it later. And the problem number five, indexing and design, that is actually quite well described by, I mean, quite quite well explored by Autodesk with their uh, design graph. And here, well, the first step which which the guys did over there was to create a neural network which can recognize types of geometries based on their shape. And once you have this neural network which can uh, put a name on every part, uh, well, you can link the parts together, right? You can use the neural network to tell you how much item uh, is similar to a screw or maybe how much is it similar to some kind of a, a, a spring or you know, whatever geometry you can think about. In here, you have the mold plate, and you can see that differences are minor, and all of them might be a mold plate or a cavity plate. And by, by you know, by basically by crawling through a, through a data set of 3D models, uh, 3D designs, they were able to create, they will, the guys were, the guys over at Autodesk were able to create this index or the catalog of parts, which were used in all of those uh, projects and yeah that's because this this presentation is a bit shorter than I usually give so I don't really have all the images but you are welcome to see the entire description of this project under this link and if someone needs a link I can also uh, share it directly <clears throat> so uh, the next problem is dynamic modification and learning in design and to be honest I was not able to find anything about that I think that this is the problem which it's still a lot of more exploration in the research and academia. So uh, the problem is that we can learn on the go, right? So if we if we design a building once, or if we design any mechanical part once, and then something fails, we would like to come up with a better solution the next time, just to learn on the fly, right? So with the new instance of the design, we just want to be able to to improve the design, or in the case of, of architecture, as seen as the, in, the, in the quote, unlike in fields which rely on detective processes, getting the same solution twice is considered a failure, right? You, as an architect or industrial designer, you want to be, be original with every single project you come up with. And this is a problem with AI and design as well. We, we can, let's say, Imagine the best parametric model by by finding uh, you know an optimal solution, but there is only one optimal solution. I mean, in most cases, it's not. But let's say that's for the sake of the discussion here. We can assume that there is only one optimal solution. 
So generalization in design, that is something which I'm kind of stretching this problem here. Uh, but again, to talk about the bridge, we use neural networks to predict the forming process. But the, the thing is that hmm, here I'm describing the, the design as a design for a single panel for the bridge. So you can see that each panel here, well, there is some symmetry, but there is only one panel of, of each type. And, and the generalization here is basically, hmm, well, how do we define the, the deflection of each part uh, of each panel based only on the on a small subset of the panels? So the generalization of knowledge here is mo mo mostly about the knowledge about fabrication process, which is being generalized from a couple of panels, all of them. And uh, yeah, so this is basically a problem of going from digital to physical, how to how to get the the right uh, fabrication parameters. And you can see that in this case, that's a project which we did at CETA a couple of years ago. Uh, in this case, you can see that the forming process is called incremental surface forming. And the robot uh, has a very simple tool, which it pushes against the sheet of metal. And there are two robots from the other, from two sides, but still even with two robots, we have uh, the material flexing back and forth. As you saw in the animation, I can just play it again, right? So you can see that the, model, that the metal sheet actually flexes back and forth. That's because it's, plastic. it's, it's, it's a piece of metal, right? So it's flexible. Uh, and the problem was that we, we didn't know how to predict the flexing. So in the, in the final design, you, you saw there are some cones introduced in those larger areas. We actually have some cones which accommodate for the precision, for, for the lack of the precision. But uh, second. But we also had another approach, uh, which tried to use neural networks to predict the deflection, to predict the error, and correct it. So here we had the input, which was the design geometry and the measured deviation. So we actually took the, the panels. We took a small subset, of, I think something like eight or nine panels from the bridge. We scanned them, compared them to the initial geometry, which was used to, to create the toolpath for the robot. And we, we use a neural network to correlate those two data sets. And thanks to that correlation, we were able to generalize this knowledge about the forming process to other panels, right? So, well, the, the, it proved to be quite successful. We were able to reduce the error. Uh, but I think that, well, there is quite a lot of research more on that required to, to get some more uh, well, more, more actually refined workflow. This was uh, this was a bit hacky, but in the end, uh, we have a really nice uh, paper about it. It will be linked in the in the end of, of the presentation, and you can see how it goes, and you can read a bit more about how we define the panels and how we get the samples from the panels. So, yeah. problem number eight is the situation recognition design. So, at each point, you want to know what is the context in which you are designing you want to you want to you want to be aware of the current situation you want to recognize the situation and you want to, the ai to do the same so uh, one of the papers which i found uh, quite interesting in that area is a paper from a Acadia conference from two years ago and you can see the paper here in the slide uh, what the what the, what the paper describes is a method to, to use uh, isovis to recognize different spatial arrangements. And yeah, this is this is a really nice this is a really nice piece of paper. The guys were able to recognize different well different architectural features, and I think that this this could lead somewhere in this in this direction of this situation recognition design. Uh, well, to be a bit more technical, they use convolutional neural networks over those bitmaps. The bitmaps are basically that maps, and they are compared here with isovis. The mechanics is exactly the same. The isovis work in 2D, and the depth map is basically uh, something which you might be familiar with from rendering software. And yes, this is this is one example for the situation recognition design. Well, and now the more speculative part for the end. 
uh, well, the creativity in design. So when you Google creativity and AI, uh, you are mostly going to run into CycleGun. Uh, and the CycleGun is a, is a neural network which is able to, for instance, transfer one painting style to an image. So just like here, I have an input image, and you can ask the neural network to render it so that it looks like it was painted by someone else. And yeah, the, the question is, I think that the, the principal question is that, you know, we cannot really say what is creativity in design. I mean, we kind of can, but it's really, kind of, it's really hard to quantize this metric. And it's also a very philosophical question if you think about it. And yeah, I, I don't think that anyone tries to answer it in, in a way that can be, let's say, coded or used by computer scientists. I don't think that the computer scientists are actually interested in creativity as a cognitive process. I think that well, cognitive, 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 cognitive science is probably a bit more into that. Well, anyway, this is another example We're using CycleGun by Benjamin Philbrick from ICD. And uh, he's basically taking pictures from Rhino, transferring them to CycleGun, rendering them as if they were sketches, hand sketches, and, and transferring them back into the UI. So <clears throat> this is one, one really great example of, of using CycleGun. And again, well, the question remains is, is can you consider it creative? I would say that, mm, I mean, my personal opinion of cre on creativity is, well, it, those tools can be certainly used in a creative way as a creative application of CycleGun, but they are not really creative themselves. So it's still the designer being the creative part. I'm concerned about this phased ramen transition here. <laughs> That's uh, probably one of the strangest bits here. And uh, problem number 10, I think it's also quite, uh, quite well uh, established in the research. And this is an example by Robert Vierlinger from, from Vienna. And uh, he actually taught a neural network how to predict the, of the topology optimization results in this, in this simple case. It was a study he did a couple of years ago. But he never really released a paper. I asked him about a specific paper about it, but he never really got to write one. So I'm trying to push him to do that because I think it's I think it's really great. Like a topology optimization, you know, it takes it takes some time to run it, and then the neural network doesn't really uh, take that much time. It takes milliseconds compared to seconds, and it could be like a really nice uh, interactive tool. When it comes to interactivity, this was one of the tasks uh, for. Uh, Samuel Wilkinson and Sean Anna in their paper about the approximation computational fluid dynamics for generative tall building design, as you can read here. Uh, this, on the other hand, is an evaluation of the turbulence patterns. So again, it's possible to run a CFD simulation in, in a computer, but it takes a lot of time. And then the neural network, which they came up with, was able to predict those patterns much faster. Of course, it's not accurate. Uh, but it's quite close to the actual results from the CFD simulation. And this quite close is, is good enough for the designer to evaluate the actual patterns. And I, I think this, is, this, is, this could be a, a really good tool for actually designing some urban context. I think that's the website. That's the object website. You, can, you are welcome to visit our website. And this is a list of papers. And if I'm missing some paper, uh, I think I'm missing one paper actually of my own. But if you are interested in that, please give me a message. Send me a message and I'm more than happy to link you. So I think that's uh, the end of the presentation. So thank you. And if there are any questions, if there is a question, question time. Um, thanks, Matthias. Um, we don't seem to have any immediate questions, but uh, we can come back after after Emmett's presentation since we're running a little behind here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead then and give the presentation to Emmett. Mm -hmm.
So, so Emmett Crewe is a, a BIM and design technology expert and an entrepreneur. He previously worked as a structural consultant and then as a BIM manager um, at Arup here in San Francisco. And there he was introduced to computational design. Um, eventually, kind of building on that, Emmett started his own company called BIM, uh, called ConnectedBIM.io uh, in, in about summer of last year, which focuses on framing automation and prefabrication. Uh, Connected BIM offers consulting, parametric content, and automation tools for a, vi a variety of workflows and disciplines. Um, and they specialize in framing automation, integrated BIM workflows, and automation tools for Epic. So take it away, Emmett. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Let me just uh, get situated here. I was waiting a little longer than I thought I was going to be, and I had enough time to uh, crash a file and get it started back up. So that's okay. We're it's back. Okay. All right, so uh, a little bit about me, uh, my company. I uh, started a company, ConnectedBIM.io, um, and uh, it's a, uh, I do consulting work, um, traditionally trying to bridge gaps uh, for design, construction, and manufacturing by introducing um, Introducing teams that you know companies that have been around a while or or um, or brand new, um, but have been focused lately on, on the ones that have been around a while and uh, um, introducing them to new tools and and adapting their uh, useful their good workflows into new formats such as you know using computational design, um, taking a much uh, higher higher level of standardization, a very programmatic approach to, to their standards and, and definitions, um, setting up, you know, key terms for how things will be called, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, certain view types or, or view uses, but um, very much um, pinning these things down and, and, and that way you're, you're enabling automation. Everybody wants automation and everybody wants, you know, how do we start to automate stuff? And I start talking about standards and, and aligning things. And they said, no, no, we want to talk about automation. And I said, well, you know, we could write a script, but it's not going to work tomorrow because you guys, it, it takes a, um, a, a very much a higher level of discipline than, uh, than a lot of the, anything else probably I've ever done in my life. Um, as far as, you know, jumping in, um, learning to program for me has been, you know, very much as a BIM manager at Arup, I, I needed things done and I needed them done like now. So I didn't have time to go in and learn how to use um, uh, design script or, or Python right off the bat. I was basically just mashing tools up from different packages and, and some of the core nodes to get things done. And uh, I don't think it was a terrible way to learn. I actually got a lot done a lot faster and then kind of gradually started breaking things down and learning the uh, um, learning to uh, write with the design script and Python and, and a lot of the other things. Um, I mean, a lot of the other more advanced tools that uh, and um, uses. Um, I got into um, what else? Move the slide. Yeah, not much more going on there. Um, so um, yeah, I think I covered the slide too. Uh, standardization and, and also kind of to remember to simplify things too, just because we're using technology and all these uh, um, and uh, uh, machine learning and advanced processes, that doesn't mean that things have to get more complicated. They actually should be more uh, as simple as possible, finding parallels to um, enable multi-platform integration just by really just setting those key terms and how things will be called across the board, whether it's, you know, Excel spreadsheets, or um, in AutoCAD layers, translating them into you know your Revit parameters, um, and even using, in fact, um, the translation processes of of taking DWG lines into Revit as native families. If you go ahead and align all your DWG lines by like a mechanical system, or or and just give them a um, a uh, delimited name that can be broken down in Revit, you can you can then um, that's actually um, later in this uh, in this talk, but maybe I won't even get to it because I think I'm a little shorter on time than I thought. But that's actually my favorite workflow I ever got into was um, uh, learning to convert Navisworks and uh, um, Navisworks and Katia and, and it, basically any FBX and able to convert it into native Revit content. That was really, really cool to me. Um, and I got, I mean, I got good at it. I got good at it. You know, you're just kind of breaking down the geometry to find the endpoints of pipes. 
uh, and, and you know, basing you're keying off of um, shapes and, and and sizes. I would do like a whole sweep of the whole of a of a massive um, um, cloud of of lines and circles and dots and and. and trying to find very, very specific size arcs because those arcs would, would tie me back to um, PVC pipe sizes. So then I'd be able to uh, classify the system by the different sizes because they're very unique. You know, they're, they're slightly, they're similar, like as far as a, um, um, can you remember the different, the schedules of pipe for the PVC? But yeah, they're just very slightly different. So then I was able to take that back to the book and say, okay, that's a uh, schedule 40. and. Uh, that was, it took me a while to get to that conclusion. And there was a lot of other trial and error in between there. So I was like, at the end, I said, wow, you know, I got it. It's one of those things you wish you found it before. But um, in that process, you know, I learned a lot about breaking down geometry, um, which is um, kind of what Dynamo is all about, right? Um, breaking things down to their core geometries and just and back into lines, circles and squares, you know, when we all uh, most of us got out of AutoCAD. We thought that, you know, we're getting away from all that, but then now we're right back into it. And um, it's a little bit more exciting in Dynamo. Um, uh, it's a, uh, I, I was, uh, fell in love with Dynamo right away when I got into it. And uh, that was, uh, I'd say 2016, 2016, I was dead set on learning to code, uh, learning to write plugins with C sharp. And I thought Dynamo was a big distraction from that. And, and I didn't really want anything to do with it. And then, ended up at uh, going to built conference that year in Phoenix and uh, got into some some of the classes and I was just like whoa okay yeah I'm gonna go try dynamo when I get home um, and uh, it's just it, it really just took off from there and, and it, it's a Keep going. I want to finish, finish your thought I want to ask a question um, it, it just really really took off from from there um, and, and it was, it's all about that icebreaker, you know, I mean, for people getting into it, I think most of us sitting in this room ha have been using Dynamo and are pretty, are most likely advanced users. But, you know, uh, what I tell people just getting into it is, you know, find that icebreaker. I remember at Era, you know, one of those things is just completely ridiculous that you're, you're going to either you or someone on your team is going to have to do. Um, we had a, um, and Chris, you probably remember this. Um, we had a, you know, airport. Uh, airport layout they had some 10,000 fire sprinkler heads and they were all um, done in AutoCAD and all they had was little red circles all over the place where they wanted them um, and and then uh, the guys call this was in uh, our New York office they called and said hey we really need you guys to jump on this one for us we need someone to go in there and place 10,000 sprinkler heads and I'm like oh whoa 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 say that again and uh, I figured out what they were doing and basically just going floor plan like sector by sector because you can't do the floor plan it's huge um, so little sector by sector and just literally dropping them in there and then going into a different view and, and, and or grabbing the element and, and telling it to go up. Um, and I was just like, whoa, okay, there's my icebreaker. I'm, I'm learning Dynamo and I basically stayed, I think I stayed at work all night that night. But by the next morning, I had written a script that then pumped in 10,000 sprinkler heads um, through a, a ray trace up to the ceiling and sucked them up there, had them all the right type in the right rooms and, and I mean, it was pretty, uh, pretty impressive stuff, and uh, um, and it uh, it all kind of comes back around, you know, because I'll get into that later. Because it, um, it's it, all these things lead into one to another, and and that I'll save that for the end. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to you at this point, but uh, it's okay. Do you mind um, if I ask a question quick? Not at all. Sorry about that. Okay. I meant to get back. I don't here. know if uh, I'll try to talk loud. Hopefully, people. Um, so you mentioned unpacking. The geometry from a difference like Navis works, yeah, and then getting it over to Revit. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had to get to a point where you actually could lace that base geometry with like information so it was more intelligent, or if you were kind of rebuilding, you know, like if, if uh, geometry has you know the eye and BIM, there's a lot of information we have embedded onto that geometry, which is the whole point. Were you able to actually um. transfer data across geometries and then rebuild that? Yes, uh, in, in different ways. You know, one, like I said, was researching the sizes, um, geometry, geometries that way. Another way was uh, um, just going off of the, the kind of shape and, and knowing how MEP systems are going together, trying to, um, you know, look at them in an overhead view and find um, find indicators of what, what it was going to be, you know, and, and then 
learning to um, separate out, you know, because everything comes in as a solid. So you've got all these different complex solids, simple solids. So ended up just throwing them all in a bucket and saying, if it has more than X amount of faces, I don't want it. You know, it's like six faces or something and, and just boot all that out the door. So I'd get my ducks, pipes and, and um, and whatnot from there. I don't know. That's kind of not really answering your question, but yeah, it was a difficult problem. Um, but we, you know, some of the like if someone makes a conscious decision as an engineer yeah. in one environment, but then you can transfer to the rev environment. You know, you don't want to lose that information. Yeah. To do it. So maybe rather than being a really good listener and reversing it all and then rebuilding it all, well, it's like if you can pipe some of that. I guess I would definitely. I would. De I was definitely doing that, but it was more like if I could get a. Um, a line of the name of the type of element from the Navis works, uh, or sometimes there'd be some indicator in there to the size or system. Um, and there were like, you know, there, it was some kind of mashed together name that these things had split by hashtags and underscores and, and dollar signs. So, I mean, eventually when I read it enough, I, I found little um, uh, abbreviations that led me to systems and, and, and had I solved it, but it was a bit of a um, research trial and error. Um, yeah, but it, it can do like, you know, I, IFCs, um, uh, Navisworks, pretty much any 3D file. You're basically converting it to an object file and then um, running a workaround. And there's like a lot of different tools that can do it. Um, online converters and ASIMP. Uh, I think Dynamo runs on ASIMP 3D something, something or other on the, uh, for their 3D uh, generation. Um, it's a open source. 3D generator. Um, yeah, I got it way off track there. Um, so this is, yeah, this is kind of a, a boring one. We'll move on. I'm sure you guys had a glance at that, you know, kind of just saying how I break down the work structure. Um, really, uh, the most common things I end up helping people with are, are sometimes pretty ridiculous. And, and it's like, getting in there the very first things i do you know is are, are set up people's platforms and, and it's crazy how many people will go through the same thing over and over again knowing that there's a much better way to do it and they hate the process they're they, you know they're they're cussing mad about it every time but yet they'll do the same thing over and over again um so just kind of getting in there and, and kind of reminding people that you know it's it takes discipline to get from here to there and it's not just uh, um hey let's let's do automation let's do uh, machine learning guys let's go um, it, it very much takes a, a it's a very stepped process um, that uh, I mean, I'm not by, all, by any means an expert in uh, machine learning and those things, but I think I'm getting there and, and uh, it, it's a very gradual process um, and just try not to take in too much at once because, you know, it's it, there's a lot. So I like to just kind of bump along here. And so if I can get into the, the actual tools that I got, I know that that's a little bit more exciting. Um, so these i'll talk about these real quick but i want to get into the dynamo nodes so um this uh, the custom custom detail assemblies and uh, um and 3d um assembly families that i'm building are I, I haven't seen anything like them and not to say that someone out there i've seen some pretty awesome stuff but i mean it's for for cold form steel and, and for um fabrication ready panels. I haven't seen anything quite like what I put together and, and I'm sure somebody's building it somewhere and um, by all means, I, I mean, um, good luck to them and hope they do something great with it. Um, I've seen a lot of the um, kind of array placement tools that, that'll run a line and, and shoot, um, uh, shoot rays up and, and basically um, run either structural framing or individual pieces and parts and, and to uh, create a wall framing. Um, and I, what I do is I, I'm building it into, I have actually multiple methods, but the very, the, the key method I'm using is, is by putting it into a, like a double, triple, quadruple nested family that has a lot of the logic is built into the family itself, uh, whether it's the first layer, second, third, or fourth. Um, but, uh, with doing multi-nesting, you're able to kind of play with the, uh, um, offsets of arrays and do some things that you can't do within a single file. Um, and I don't want to bore you with talking about it. Let's look at it. Um, so the, uh, the framing tools, like, you know, the scene, when you're seeing on the top left there, uh, and I can show you it in Revit, hopefully, if my um, things are behaving and to see my mouse is flying around funny. Um, so this one here, it's able to, to accommodate um, split heights 
doors, uh, windows, and uh, um, it'll keep your on center studs and it'll, it'll um, give way for an opening and run your header and king studs on the side. And I'll pull up the actual family and show you. Um, but uh, um, the, the key to it is that it's, it's all based on um, very lightweight parts and pieces. I think the whole entire family, and it has you know a top track, bottom track. These are designated as different members because they're end studs, king studs. It has jam, a header sill. Um, it, the whole thing weighs is like 650 kilobytes. And that's, I don't know, I didn't know how that happened, but I guess it's, uh, um, it, it's pretty lightweight. I've, uh, let's see if I can pull it up for you guys. I actually had some issues with uh, Revit, of course. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, so it, it flew in here. Um, so what you're seeing in here, I actually just ran it a couple times because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to have issues and then um, ran it a couple more times and actually did crash. So, um, but it looks like it all came back here. Um, so what I did in this, this, the, I guess I'm comfortable taking it back now so that it'll probably run again. You guys know how it is anytime you're showing something live. Um, but what you're seeing is, you know, these, all the walls have been laid out with the, the stud framing. I still got to enter in the doors, but, uh, and, and account for the, um, the ends. So, cause the ends will kind of mate with each other. You have a female or a male, they'll push out, um, or, or retract to be able to get that, uh, corner join. Um, I go ahead and I know this one's a little messy. I was actually throwing it into the, I'll pop this guy over here. Oh yeah, there he is. I promised my wife, I think she might be listening, that I would not do any live demonstrations. So if you're listening, honey, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, she she gets worried about that stuff. And, and quite frankly, so do I. Um, all right. So that, that's not working. Let's let's pull the panel out. Um, so this guy here um, is the panel I was talking about, and it's a it's a framing panel. I have other one that has the um, has sheathing on the outside. I can go ahead and pop a door in this guy and, and say control framing two. Um, oh, I guess that that hid the bottom framing there. Huh? Open framing of one. Open framing one, I'll put a door in there and I can center it on, on any door that uh, that comes across my wall. Um, I come have a little issue. Framing, framing type, framing control. Oh, there we go, I see it. So I have a framing control button because um, the if I run these arrays, they're actually really fast. If I go at a zero, because then it doesn't run your, your middle studs um, so then I can put these frame casings around walls and, and just run like a whole building in like a matter of minutes. And then when I step away, then I can generate all the, the intermittent pieces. Um, so what I do then is I take that architect's model and I just, I usually split it floor by floor and I go ahead and read all the walls in, in their, in the model. And, um, Architects are getting better and better and better. I think three, four years ago, I had to do a lot of back checking and, and I still back check, of course, but you know, you're getting models that actually have the right materials in them and, and everything's, things are getting so much better. So, and, and working with, um, I work with a lot of good companies, you know, like Gensler, or I get these models that are just amazing and I can plug right into them and, and, and filter for um, uh, structural core of, of metal stud if that's what I'm looking for, shoot it out. And then I just get the, the, um, the identity data that I'm looking for that wall is the depth, um, the height, obviously but that's it on a, by instance basis. Then, you know, the depth, the, the framing members, and, and then any wall ratings it carries. Um, and I'm able to, uh, um, spit out a report to a text file uh, of the different wall types. And then, um, from there, um, create these panels for each wall type. And the, the, one of the really great things about the panel is that it's instance based. So I don't have 10 different panels for 10 different walls. I got one panel and they're just tied together by, uh, um, you know, if I come in here and, and do something ridiculous with this guy and 
bear with me because it's got a lot of parameters and I'm building a little GUI that can handle them um, in a little box for it for me, but I don't have it quite ready. Um, uh, opening seal height. I didn't even put the door in there for you yet. I get to talking. So is this targeting like general contractors or cost estimators? Or like you know, the, the what I really have ready to fly right now is, is stuff that's uh, more in tune with like a, um, LOD 350 uh, interior um, uh, TI work, and that's ready to rock and roll. But the um, the prefab stuff um, that's more geared towards like a um, modular or, or prefab panel building, that is, is it takes it up to another higher level because then you're talking LOD 400, 450, you gotta get real, um, pretty intense and that's where these things are really really beneficial because it's all one one element and you don't have moving pieces and parts it, it makes it a lot easier to um to handle and, and have things not come apart um i'm sorry i get to talk i can't um so i guess the goal with what you're doing is getting a fabrication ready model yes prefab or framing or well, the, the fabrication ready models, um, there's two sides to it, see, because that, that interior LOD 350 stuff, I'm just getting, literally putting these frames on them and matching the height of the wall, and then um, then uh, basically just putting uh, critical studs and, and doors, and that's about it. And then when you get into prefab, I mean, you're talking, you got to get into, and um, you know, straps on the windows, um, hold downs, I mean, everything, everything that's in that wall needs to be there. And one of the things that I, that I put to, that uh, was really cool is I, I've built a lot of generic annotations that, that um, are workarounds to using Revit schedules. So then I can take a wall panel and, and read, use it as a, a bounding region and read everything that's in it, uh, be it uh, pipes, be it anything, um, electrical stuff, or, uh, or if you've stuck a little mouse in there, um, in Revit, you, you know, it'd read out that there was a mouse in the wall. Uh, it, it, uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's not overly complicated, and I'm sure anybody that with, with uh, some decent Dynamo skills will jump right in and could recreate that, but it was, uh, it was very valuable, because I know a lot of people were struggling with the fact of having, um, uh, having to use different schedules and just the the nature of Revit schedules being kind of finicky and having to just really get in there and all the different menus. It just takes a long time to mess with. So I'm able to just get a, um, a list and pipe it right into a, um, a generic annotation. Let's let's look at. I get a little long-winded, guys, and I, I I am short on time. I think the early the guy before me went longer than um the plan. So it's got me kind of scrambling here, but. So um, I want to. Uh, do you guys have any questions about these panels? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open Dynamo and then uh, try to get that rock and roll in here and, and see if I can get some of these doors to pop up for you guys as well. I also have built um, these these rain screen panels that are really intense because they have a lot more to them. They're actually five layers. If you guys like to see that, I'll pull it up. Um, it's not just the stud and the, the stud wall. It's actually got um, horizontal Z clips, vertical Z clips, and then it has the panels on the outside. It's it's pretty cool. Um, everything works slower. Maybe it's just because I'm standing up here. Ah, okay, so that guy just popped in a little window. Um, you can see I can adjust those to whatever the, the opening ends ends up being. And, and like I said, I can show you that this header piece, because it's a small opening, it's showing up here as a um, as a single track header. If I pop that window to like a, um, a couple sizes up, oh, I have that window opening tool in here. Um, open width, open width of 72 inches. You'll see this guy, I set some presets, some sizes, you know, it'll bump to a nested track and then it'll go to a, um, eventually up to a um, five piece box header. Looks like at 72 inches, you're getting a, either a four or five piece box header. 
So that's nice to not have to load different families for your different spans. Um, that's actually really nice. Um, don't have to worry about it. I mean, you have to open that fit one family up and set your span charts and, and then um, it'll extrapolate from there. Um, I feel like I'm asking only questions. Sorry. No, no, you're bring it on. I'd love to. I'm wondering like if an owner or architect or somebody's requested and has built model as like a leave behind. So like you get it done. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering kind of the fundamental scoping question, which is the need to model studs, right? Because you kind of, we typically write it as a rule, right? And then the contractor knows to build it, you know, a certain way. Um, but what I'm wondering is the, the owner might want, want to need it for coordinating uh, and maintaining and operating the facility. And I'm wondering if people have been getting requested like to have a higher level of detail you know, you know that kind of a lot of times what I'm seeing is, is and, and I'll agree with you that a lot of times you're getting it as a, as a project requirement and they're just checking off a box saying, you know, we need to have LOD, LOD 300 or 350 because I think at 300 they're saying just to put the wall and no stud and then you get to 350 and, and you get to um, adding um, the, the outside frames and the, and the headers and, and um, you know, you get some different uses for it. Sometimes it's it's material takeoffs. Sometimes it's guys that want to bundle and tag everything and have it all pre-cut, whether it's not necessarily prefab, but uh, just prepared so that they can uh, bundle it, tag it, and then send it to different waypoints on their job. So that, uh, um, and, and, you know, I guess somewhat uh, not prefab, but pre, uh, pre-cut and, and pre-arranged that way. Um, hospitals, anything that's, that's uh, Oshpod, is going to require it at, at a pretty high level. Uh, um, and that's that's most likely going to be like every single stud for, you know, that's what they want for those type of jobs. Um, and just the overall speed of, of what I'm able to do with this, with the panel that I have, this, I have a um, panel with sheathing on the outside. And even with the sheathing, I'm able to spit you out um, a lot more accurate material quantity with the, the sectioned out pieces and your, your um, your lines that, that you want to um, run and, and it's all adjustable. So if, if I can run you, um, you know, not the greatest example here, but I, I placed these studs in the wall. There's some adjustments to be made. And, and this is actually my backup computer. I was walking to BART and the little slip in the, my backpack opened, my computer dumped and like did this crazy tumble. So um, this, this is a good computer. I'm not, uh, don't get me wrong, but I did have a, um, a couple of, uh, um, crashes here and, and uh, I don't know I don't know what to say about it um, but it happened and so um, adding to that I'm, I'm working on a design build project with a web park and as part of that they're doing cost detection and they're actually they're getting their drywall stuff to model all the sets in and it was actually surprisingly helpful because some of the things they could catch like they could have um we found out that some of the king studs for the doors are intersecting with with some of our mechanical groups, some of our ducks, so we had to move those ducks out of the way. So there actually were some clashes with the metal family that was helpful to know about that. You know, thanks for mentioning that too, because that um, when 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 I was working for um, a, the drywall, when I was doing the, um, the structural. Um, consulting structural engineering working for drywall companies is that we would go in, we'd find a lot of constructability issues all the time in, in uh, um, doing the framing. Um, I know everybody's got to go and I, I was a little shorter on time, but if we could, uh, you know, I'm not asking you to stay, by all means you got work to do, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to keep rolling through these dynamo nodes because that was actually probably the coolest part of uh, that in the framing. Unfortunately, I, I lost that model I was trying to really show, but it can, um, these guys can run off a line, which I'll just do real quick before I create some. It's nice to, uh, um, I can just pick a line and run these guys, or I can, you know, kind of click on a, on a, one of the guys and create similar. I don't know what's going on. Whatever. Yeah, I can just grab a line and draw these guys. Usually, I, can't whatever I'll stop. Um, so the um, I'll bring up the blue beam because that's maybe the best way to show the nodes. And then if you guys want to look at them in Dynamo, I can pull it up. These nodes are quite awesome. Um, I, I you know painstakingly have gone through my package and upgraded it to um, 2.1. 
and I got like some 300 nodes in my package and I was set to, re um, I had never published it officially and I was going to do that about a month and a half ago. And then I mistakenly thought that there weren't going to be any issues in upgrading and upgraded things and just weird stuff started to happen. And I've had to, um, I've really had to, uh, learn a lot about using, you know, things like regex and crazy things that I never, you know, it's a great skill, but I, I didn't think I was going to learn it a couple weeks ago, and, and I did, and because I needed to go in and, and and make some adjustments on a. What's the name of that package? Um, right now it's Connected Design, and it, it's funny because I saw you at AU and you said, uh, "Hey, Emmett, it's good to see you here, man." I saw you were on the, they had your name on the board at the, the class session I was at. You know, Carl Storms. I'm like, no, I mean, I met him, but. And uh, I was like, there's no way my name was on the board because I didn't have any Dynamo packages. But then um, I remembered I post, I put up a package. It was literally one node. And, and then Carl Storms put this, I very carefully put a great node on there. And, and um, he, my, my node was sitting up there with, um, with like clockwork and, and data, in between clockwork and data shapes. And there's my little node sitting there. Have you tried these packages? And I was like, all right, I guess. It was a really good note. I mean, if it, he must have liked it. I asked. I haven't had a chance to ask him. I definitely thanked him, but um, there must have been a reason, you know. I mean, one put that one little dude up there, um, you know, and it was a good node. So um, um, these um, dynamic selectors are really my thing. So this get views by type. These guys take index or string, and, and I can pick the drawing sheets by saying um, I'm showing you here with a two, or down here I can put sheet in. And I get the same output. It, it, it's a pretty cool way to filter things. Um, levels from document. This is another one, and this is a um, this one truncates when selected. So when it has no input, you'll get like 10 levels. But then if you put um, a matching portion of string or the index of the level you want, you just get the item out of the other side. Um, those are really cool. But the the heavy hitter. I, I, is my favorite probably of all the nodes I've built is this uh, filter by and set parameter. And a lot of times you get into these complicated nodes and they can be a little finicky, but this one is a, is a beast and it's lightning fast. I don't know what I did to make it so fast, but it's faster than a lot of the other nodes that have a lot less to them. Um, what, what I can do is put in a category or a list of elements and it's going to give me all the parameters that, um, are in the elements out the other out of the other side, and then I can choose an, um, a parameter at that in at, from that index to then filter um, by a string match, um, and then pick a different parameter from that list and set it uh, to another value, which is uh, and it's so fast. So I can like say filter out all my sheets that have a certain character in them, or all my views, maybe you know anything. Um, and it's really, um, it'll shoot out the um, the parameter value in in uh, in, uh, in the value in the in its natural format, and then it'll also give you a, a forced string value so that you can have both to to weigh things out. Um, sometimes you need one or the other, um, and this is it. Uh, this is when I I grabbed this wall here. I guess this is the other half of this. Then I grabbed that wall and I said uh, number 20, send the unconnected height to 111 feet, and that's what you're seeing here. Is I, I filtered it by a comment and then sent it um, flying. So um, a lot of those type of nodes are in this package that are really really functional. Like get elements in view by category. So it'll get you all the categories in the view, and then next to it you got a number. That's the number of types that are also in that view, and then below it. Um, it, it has these uh, your types again, and you can select that type, and you get all instances of your type, and you get the type out of the other side. So then you can put the type into like a set parameter node, and, and um, you know access your your um, things a lot quicker and easier that way. Um, um, one of the ones that I've really liked and it's very simple is it pulls up every single type from the um, the database type class, and then it has one of those dynamic filters on it, so I can put literally just view, and V-I-E-W, and then stick it into this type class search, and it shoots me out every single view type, um, all the different, you know, it's great for model management and, and a kind of a high level overview of like, you know, your sec if you're working with view references or section heads or some weird type of family or your styles, you can get in there and just blow them out um, with, the, with this tool. 
Um, I appreciate, you know, those who have stuck around too. I know that uh, I probably got dug into by well, about 20 minutes and it's like I'm wrapping up on that 20 minutes. Um, so you're welcome. Thank you. Um, is this, this stuff interesting to you guys? Is there anything, any questions you have um, about, uh, you know, maybe some of the, the nodes or some of the framing tools or getting this stuff published? Um, I, I think it's a very, very useful set of um, tools, especially the Dynamo stuff. Do um, you plan to make this public? I think I will. You know, I've kind of waited out and, and I very much, uh, you know, I'm here and I, I'm one of the best things about learning and being part of Dynamo is the community and the knowledge sharing. Um, but then there's also some of these things like this filter by and set. I, I mean, I probably spent 50 hours on that thing and, and actually it's very, very powerful so that you can, you can manage your model. I feel like I'm like pulling strings up here and just making things happen with it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I've kind of wavered on that on certain ones, and maybe like the the dynamic function tools, like these. Um, I got some like list clean out, list uh, clean output that like, well, it's like they're all for back filtering. You know, it gives you your your clean list without any empty or or nulls, and then it gives you another list with a, um, an empty string replacing each removed piece, so that you because sometimes you need to have that space uh, maintained to be able to keep your node uh, or your um, workflow, you know what I mean? Um, so you got to keep fly the um, a, an empty space for nodes and stuff for um, null and whatnot. So, um, but I think I've I've come to the conclusion that you know I've gotten so much from the community and, and it's like it's a part of it's about giving back. Part of it's about you know just one if I keep these on my computer, um, you know how I some of them I built two years ago and they're I use them all the time and they're great. And, and if I keep them on my computer, how you, how good is that? Unless I, if I could share it, um, you know, the things I've learned from guys like, uh, um, you know, Colin McCrone, who was here earlier, or, um, or, you know, just a lot of the other guys that paved the way, I, I think it's kind of, uh, it's my place to kind of give back because these nodes were all built, you know, on top of like clockwork and these other things. And I eventually got in there and learned how to do it myself. But, you know, at first I was just literally stitching these things together um and so without their work i wouldn't have mine and, and they've definitely shared theirs so um i think it's a it's a good thing to share it um the the framing tools on the other hand are just, i mean quick, sure going back to the framing, the framing tool yeah is there a threshold between what is uh functional and useful and you start and you're crossing that threshold into like Maybe it starts to get the model a little bit too big, or there's there's too many parameters. Um, that's that's a lot of the a lot of the questions that we have as, as far as support is oh my model's going really slow, right? Or or this family's moving really really slow, and it's it starts to it starts to blow it. Have you have you had any pushback from yeah? Um, or from, well, you know, what I've done to just kind of keep the, my sanity is usually take it by like um, levels. Take it by levels. If you're going into real high LOD, because if you're getting with too many pieces and parts, especially with the disconnected, um, uh, fragmented, you know, if you're running like, you know, and I, I, I've used Struxoft and Agacad, and they're good programs. And I, I'm not saying that they're not. Um, I'm just saying when you have, especially for the prefabrication, when you get a nice tight bundled um, panel with all the pieces and parts can't be broken, and it's very, very stable. Um, it, uh, it is actually very beneficial. Um, but yes, I think it can, you know, if it, a lot of times these guys are using it, it's just a check and uh, check box in a requirement in many projects. However, there are values that can be had by the, the um, framing contractors. It's just, they're so set in their way of doing things. It would really take them to, to take a more um, data centric and BIM approach to their work. And unless they're someone's kind of forcing that hand, it's generally not going to happen. Um, or, but I have had some clients that I show some of the things I can do, like reading the architect's model and instantly spitting out a, a very preliminary but fairly accurate um, uh, material list, that kind of stuff. They're just oh, they're blown away because they got a guy, you know, either sometimes measuring with a, a ruler, um, you know, and uh, or usually blue beam or something like that. But uh, I would imagine there's a lot of hand holding. <clears throat> You have to do yeah uh, for guys that are, you know, 
Uh, it's tough. Yeah, it is tough sometimes because I'm, I'm like excited about it. I start talking it, you know, I got to understand who my clients are because they don't really care. And, and you know, some of them, and, and they're just like, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> get it done, get it done fast. He's like, we're, we're going to throw it away when you give it to us. So, you know, I'm like, Contractors uh, uh, who do this manually, suddenly they feel threatened by yeah, the yeah. Because a lot of times at the at the twilight of their career, that's kind of what some guys are doing. Um, I said, I said, shoulder and, used to work for a framing company in San Diego. I said, shoulder to shoulder with these guys. Yeah, they're literally going over not not PDFs, but they're going over sheets. Yeah, doing it. yeah. yeah. Now I've seen it happen, and I just kind of cringe. And is there any way you could like get these out and like? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for staying. Um, I'd like to, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep building these things and I've actually got some really, really awesome things coming for um, project communications uh, and, and, uh, and dynamic graphic displays. So I'm really pushing hard to get that stuff out because it's like using generic annotations and her characters and scripts and so again, uh, key terms in my um, in my standards that are allowing these families to take the place of schedules, and I can just display this information on it, and we actually look a lot better. Schedules are better than we good though. Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, thank, thanks, everybody. We're gonna um, cut it there. Um, if you have any questions, you can send it. I think to connectedbim.io, his his website. Yeah. Um, so thanks.